Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the three main styles of memory trace layout that you can find on, like, consumer motherboards. So, um, basically, memory trace topology. And uh, the reason why we're going to be looking, lo like, talking about this is because it's a good indicator of certain, like, fact, like, things about how motherboards behave in terms of memory overclocking, though it is really isn't the end-all be-all. Um, and mostly I'm making this because I saw a comment on Reddit um, asking uh, if Asus is the only board vendor to use T-Topology. Um, and I replied under that, like, saying some, something along the lines of, like, I think like, Gigabyte also uses it for Z390. Um, and it kind of varies board to board depending on also generation. Um, and I kind of tried to explain which ones are beneficial to what set configurations, and I think I kind of failed at that. So here's a better, more, more, uh, more clearer, great, I'm, I'm already off to a great start with the English language, more clearer explanation of, uh, what I meant by that. So, first of all, the three configurations, um, three layouts that we're going to be comparing here are basically one DIM per channel, so one DPC for short, um, then flyby or daisy chain, and I personally like the daisy chain name more because it's, it, well, I just like daisy chain. It, it sounds better. <laughs> and finally, we have T-topology. Um, and already from the color coding of the dim slots, it would, should be kind of obvious what kind of, like, what kind of differences we have here. So, let's start with one dim per channel. One dim per channel is very simple, right? We have our CPU over here. Um, and we have what channel one and we have channel two. So we just connect channel one to dim slot one, um, which really I should be doing something like, say, this, right? And then channel two would go to dim slot two, bam. Um, or if you want to make it easier on yourself, like I could have made it easier for myself and done the layout differently, but ultimately this is, like, this is the idea behind one dim per channel. You just do a direct connection to your first dim slot. You don't need to worry about anything. Now, um, if you're looking at a 4 dim motherboard on a one, you know, two channel CPU again, um, you're actually putting two memory sticks onto one channel. And that causes some issues because now we don't have one dim slot to connect to the CPU socket, we have two of them. Um, and so daisy chain takes the easy approach. You basically just go to dim slot one and then you go like that, right? Well, actually it would, to, to really, you know, give you the name there, that's daisy chain, right? You just run the trace from one slot to the next and, and don't really worry about how, how, uh, how much it impacts one of the dims because as, if you do this layout, generally you're going to have at least one slot that works pretty damn well and one slot that kind of doesn't, um, as in, it doesn't support anywhere near as high memory speeds as the other one does. And that doesn't mean it's going to be a complete disaster. This layout is used on, I think, most of MSI's Z390 lineup. It's used by the Crosshair 7 Hero motherboard. It's it's very popular. It's just that, um, yeah, it really heavily favors one of the DIMM slots. And usually, it's this one. But I have seen some motherboards where it's actually the first slot in the chain that, that's preferred. But... Um, ultimately, that depends on the specifics of the layout and uh, something that, like, you, you just need to, like, test the board um, to really figure it out which, which one's better. And for channel 2, you just do the same thing, except channel 2 has to go further away. And so that, that's a daisy chain layout. Um, and then we have T-topology. And T-topology is uh, kind of special because, again, we have our two-channel CPU, right, 1 and 2 here. And with T-topology, instead of just kind of doing whatever with the trace layout, you actually, well, kind of just neglecting one of the memory slots for sake of simplicity. With T-topology, you go out of your way to make the memory slots equivalent, right? Bam. So now they're equal distance. There's a problem with this, though. Um, this line here, either of these memory slots is longer than the longest run in a daisy chain. So this, um, if you're using, you know, two slot, uh, two memory sticks, uh, is not ideal. So, and basically, yeah, so T topology, and really it gets the T if, I, I'm gonna give myself the grid here. Give me a second so that I can better <laughs> draw why T topology is called T topology. 
So in T topology, the name comes from the fact that you literally have something that looks very much like a T, like that. Um, and even now it's not great, but you get the idea. And you do the same for the other memory channel. And I've really screwed up the layout, but whatever. Um, so yeah, and T topology does this. So then, uh, strengths and weaknesses for these different layouts. Well, uh, one dim per channel is obviously, like the weakness is you can't run a ton of RAM on it. There's just one dim per channel. So you can't do, you can't run like two 16 gig sticks you, uh, on each, well, you can't run like 64 gigs of RAM because you can't get a memory stick with uh, 30, well, you can now, but normally that's lim like, there's some Asus boards with some proprietary memory sticks that'll work and you can get 64 gigs onto a two DIM motherboard. But generally speaking, the main issue with one DIM per channel is that you're gonna be stuck, like normally a memory stick only has two memory, uh, can only go up to two ranks, uh, two ranks as in it's double-sided. And as of right now, um, there are no consume, com like consumer accessible uh, 16 gigabit memory chips. So essentially, if you wanted to run uh, the, the maximum amount of RAM you can stick in this is two memory sticks with eight gigabit memory chips. There's gonna be 16 chips for a dual rank stick. You're gonna have uh, 16 gigs of RAM on each of your sticks. So you're gonna have a total of 32. And that's where this, th this uh, layout will basically stop because you can't get higher density sticks. Now, once higher density sticks come out, uh, this stops being an issue. Now, Daisy Chain does support um, four memory sticks on a two channel CPU, so that's great. But Daisy Chain's issue is because it kind of just neglects the, like it takes the very easy route to the memory layout, uh, you end up in a situation where either this memory slot or this memory slot is gonna suck. Um, for just because of how the traces are being laid out. And there's like a lot of really complicated electrical engineering reasons why when your trace length for both memory slots isn't identical, one of the slots clocks very differently. We're not gonna get into those. All you really need to know is that, yeah, it, it just kinda, it clocks one of the sticks significantly worse than the other. Um, but it is great if you're basically like, the daisy chain works great if you want a lot of slow RAM or you want a, a little bit of very fast RAM, right? So if you're going for like 2x, uh, like let, let's say that this board here, right, does 4,400 uh, 4, megahertz. Uh, okay, let's like, let's just do some theoretical memory configurations here. So let's say this does a, um, two by eight, right? Two by eight gigabytes. And it does that at 4,400 megahertz. And that's not 4,400, that's 4,440. Um, so it does 4,400 megahertz, right? We're not gonna wa worry about the, the latency. Now, daisy chain um, for two by eight, uh, you're gonna be looking at say 4,200. And the reasoning comes down to the fact that basically the extra memory slot adds a whole bunch of uh, unnecessary parasitics to the traces. And the extra length of the traces makes even makes them, well, it's just longer. So now the signal has to, you know, travel a longer distance. It has more time to pick up, uh, the trace has more ability to pick up random uh, interference from the environment. Basically not ideal, right? Not ideal. And so you lose a little bit of memory clock. And so for a two by eight setup, you might now do 4,200 megahertz. And if you were running a four by eight, right, um, which wouldn't work here. But if you did go for a four by eight, you might run into a situation where you're gonna be stuck at um, say 3,600 megahertz, right? Which is a big drop from that 4,200 to that 3,600 megahertz. Now, T topology um, will still clock memory relatively, like will again clock even worse than daisy chain for two by eight because even the shortest length here is the like longer than than the daisy chain, just because if you actually looked at the trace layout for a real uh, T topology motherboard, right? Like th let's say this is the pins in our CPU socket here. If you're actually laying this out, what you end up doing, and this this is obviously slot one, channel one, slot two, channel one, right? Um, so we need to hook up because basically there's a bunch of traces in your memory that are shared. Um, between your two DIMM slots for the data lines. And obviously all the power and ground is shared across them as well. But 
for, for your data lines, they, they get shared uh, between the NIMS slots, depending on what they are. And in a daisy chain setup, right, like if, if I just want to connect these two pins, I just do this and I call it a day. And that's great. It's super easy to lay out. I don't need to worry about anything. Um, and at the end of the day, probably this dim slot will run better than this one, just because uh, just because of complicated uh, electrical engineering reasons that I'm actually not aware of. But as far as I know, it's usually this memory slot that ends up better off when you do this. Um, and that's nice and simple to lay out. And it's it's relatively cheap and it goes relatively fast. Um, now, T-topology is neither of those things. Um, so if we want to connect this dot and this dot, well, and we want to keep the trace length equivalent, uh, we're going to have to do something like, say, go down here, right, come through here, and then, uh, okay, that's not going to work. So we're, we're going to have to go around. Can't believe, like, I have a really, like, this is really simplified. I am also kind of constrained by the grid that I'm using, but... Um, Where's the halfway point between these two? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm a genius. <laughs> There's no way to get these equal distance. Oh boy. Oh no. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, yeah, great. I've really screwed this up. Uh, you're going to run something that maybe looks like this. Right, which that's not like an ideal setup. If if I if I had had more thought forethought with my diagram here, I would have set it up that if I did that, the the length on you know this length would be the same as this length. You can clearly see it's not, but that like I, I should have moved this dim slot. Um, I should have moved this slot like one one grid over. Um, so yeah, I didn't really think that through. Um, for, for convenience sake, but but you get the idea, right? We get this lovely T, but now you basically, if you're going to this slot, you have to go and back. And if you're going to this slot, well, you're still going like that. And that's not ideal in terms of layout. Um, so you have a bunch of extra length in this to get the slots equ uh, equal distance. And the end result is that for a two dim configuration, this will normally end up clocking even worse than a daisy chain, but it doesn't quite fall off a cliff uh, when you go to four memory sticks like daisy chain does, because essentially since you are actually keeping both memory sticks equal distance from the memory controller, um, it's actually much easier to train the timings for both memory sticks at the same time, because you're not gonna have one stick that's massively, that, you know, comes in with a completely different delay from the other stick because the distance is the same for both of them. Um, and in some, some cases, you may find that T-topology, uh, you won't actually lose any frequency at all. Usually the frequency loss is not so much from the actual board layout, it's just because you're putting more load on the CPU's memory controller by going to dual rank. But if you went, like on a T-topology board, if you run 2x16, um, and assuming that the memory sticks just don't screw up, like the memory stick PCB isn't a factor here, um, if you ran a 2x16 at 4000, and then you would also, be, well, a 2x16 would run like 3800 and a 2 uh, I I mean 4x8 would, like th these are the same is what I'm getting at, right? Because the limit here is that this is dual rank and this is also dual rank and this is single rank. So this is easier on the memory controller just in general, regardless of what layout you use, which is why this would hit 4000. Once you put more load on the memory controller with more ranks, you end up in this range of 3800 megahertz, regardless of if you're using four sticks or two sticks because uh, the board at that point doesn't like play a factor. Though admittedly, usually the double like memory sticks with two ranks on them, uh, because the memory stick itself is then more complex, those tend to be a little bit worse at memory overclocking than individual single rank memory sticks loaded into a T topology board. So that, that ends up kind of being kind of weird like that where if if you if you just ignored the factor of the memory stick PCB, then these two setups should be equivalent. But when you actually run them in reality, they aren't because this is harder on the memory manufacturer's side on, on the side of the memory stick also to to uh, wire up properly. Now, if you look at a daisy chain, um, you're gonna actually see something interesting where actually like two by sixteen um, would clock say 4,000, like, yeah, let's, let's go for it, just 4,000 megahertz, right? Um, because it's, again, two sticks, or actually it wouldn't do 4,000, but let's say it did like 3,800, 
or something. I'm not sure how exactly the comparisons would work out, but the daisy chain setup would actually show favor, uh, show priority to the 2x16 over the 4x8, because in 4x8, you're using that, you know, less than ideal memory slot, whereas in 2x16, you're still on the ideal memory slot, and the only downside is the extra load on the memory controller of the CPU. And if we move on to one DIMM per channel, then quite frankly, one DIMM per channel in 2x16 would actually have generally an advantage because the massively reduced loading, uh, like the memory slots on this just give you so much better signal integrity than any either of the four DIMM setups that 2x16 on a one DIMM per channel board, assuming the stick is ideal, right? I'm, I'm assuming the memory stick itself here is not really a factor. Um, two by 16 will work great on a one DIMM per channel. Um, so yeah, and it would actually outclock the daisy chain and the T topology board again. Um, so that's basically the, the three different layout styles that you'll see. And one DIMM per channel is of course really common on ITX and extreme overclocking motherboards. Um, so EVGA X290, like X299 Dark, EVGA Z390 Dark, uh, Asus has the Gene, the Apex boards, uh, actually Asus ITX boards for a long time when they were still doing the impact boards. Uh, the impact boards were actually really popular with extreme overclockers because they were one dim per channel. They absolutely killed it on memory overclocking. And uh, at the time, uh, well, with LN2, the entire board freezes over anyway, so you don't have to worry about the VRM so much. Um, and at the time, there also wasn't eight cores that you could run in an impact, right? Um, you didn't have to worry about so much CPU power consumption. So impacts were really, really popular for extreme overclocking because you, you, they were one dim per channel and they had a huge memory clock advantage as a result. Uh, Gigabyte with their... Uh, like SOC dash, uh, they have an SOC champion, like some of their SOC boards would go for one DIMM per channel. Um, and there's a bunch of things you can do to like improve one DIMM per channel, uh, even further in terms of memory overclocking. And there's things like uh, gigabytes done, uh, surface mount memory DIMMs, which basically reduce the parasitics of the memory DIMMs themselves even further. And by parasitics, I mean just negative electrical attributes of the memory slots just by the way they're manufactured. So just due to the physical materials they're made of. Like there's just some things you can't ri get rid of because the slot is made of metal, not of, you know, ideal uh, superconductor. So with those boards, they would go for like SMD dims. They would also do things like, like uh, Gigabyte made an SOC LN2 board where there were no uh, mounting holes for your heatsink. And the logic was, well, normally on an Intel uh, motherboard, right? Your mounting hole is gonna be right around here. Uh, so it would actually get in the way of where they wanted to run their memory traces and they just decided, okay, you know what? It's going to be easier if there's just no way to mount a heatsink onto the motherboard and it's going to be better at memory overclocking for it. So they scrapped the memory, like they, they just completely scrapped the, the, the screw holes for the heatsink for, for on that motherboard. Now on a later iteration of another Dash LN2 board, um, they decided that, you know what, maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's kind of useful to have some way to attach the LN2 pot to the motherboard when you don't have a test bench that has a, like there's some test benches which with like this arm rig thing to hold the LN2 pot in place above the CPU without using the motherboard mounting system. Um, and if you don't use one of those, right, you're kind of screwed with the motherboard without any mounting hardware. So, well, without any mounting holes. So Gigabyte eventually decided that, you know what, maybe we should put some mounting holes on it. And instead of using the Intel ones, because again, the Intel ones get in the way of the precious memory layout, um, they put AMD ones because those are rectangular and slightly more out of the way and therefore less of an issue to, tr uh, to lay out around. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot of things that like extreme, like a lot of uh, things you can do to further improve a certain layout style. Um, and th this is like, th that's actually like pretty important to keep in mind because uh, if you look at like a, a daisy chain or a T topology or a, or a one dim per channel or anything like that, um, the thing is like, I have an ITX motherboard right, which by nature of being ITX is one DIMM per channel, and it sucks at memory overclocking. It's really bad. Um, at the same time, you can have T-topology boards, which uh, clock vastly different. Um, like I have the the Gigabyte, um, like for me, for example, like a perfect example is I have a, 
Z390 Master, I have a Z370 Gaming 7, and I have a Z390, uh, uh, what's it called? Pro. Yeah, Z390 Pro from Gigabyte. All of them are from Gigabyte, all of them use T-Topology. But funnily enough, the Z370 motherboard consistently clocks better than either of the new ones, which I don't get. Well, it makes sense compared to the Pro because the Pro uses a four layer PCB. So the amount of space they have to do funky things like that is massively reduced. And that means doing this properly is much more difficult. Um, but on the Z390 Master, it's just a case of, well, they tried a new layout and it doesn't seem to be working quite as well as what I had on the Gaming 7, or they've screwed up the BIOS somehow. One of the two. So, you know, just because the t just because a motherboard uses TEEP topology doesn't tell you that it's going to be good or bad at memory overclocking, because there's different levels of implementation to TEEP topology um, that heavily affect that. And at the same time, like, if you're wondering about Daisy Chain, um, MSI likes to use Daisy Chain on their Z390 boards. I think they also use it on their X470 boards. Um, Asus has it on the Crosshair 7 Hero. Um, they, they run a daisy chain on that board. And the logic behind running daisy chain, the daisy chain on the, the Crosshair 7 Hero was basically, oh, um, we want this motherboard to be even better at memory overclocking on your standard, like most people who are going to be buying a Ryzen CPU, right? They're going to be running a 2x8 setup. And if they're not running a 2x8 setup, the memory clocks are going to suck anyway, because the Ryzen memory controller can't deal with it. Um, in my experience, even, even on like newer AGSAs, uh, once you put four memory sticks into a motherboard with a Ryzen CPU, you get like, you stop at like 3200 megahertz. On two memory sticks, you can do like 3600 plus. Um, so yeah, basically with the Crosshair 7 Hero, they decided, oh yeah, we're going daisy chain because most people are going to run two by eight anyway. And people who want more density can just go with two by 16. And 2x16 will outclock uh, two, uh, 4x8 on the Crosshair 7 Hero. If anybody was wondering about that, it do does actually do that. Um, because at that point, you're still at relative... Like, again, the, the CPU's memory controller is, like, the main issue, and you're not going to clock that high regardless. But, um, yeah, but on the Crosshair 6 Hero, um, they actually ran T-Topology. So that's why if you actually go from like a Crosshair 6 Hero to a Crosshair 7 Hero, there's a pretty big difference in how they clock memory because they're on completely different layout styles. And one is basically like a really... Uh, Asus does T-Topology a ton. Um, they support... Like they have it across a ton of motherboards. It seems to work really, really well for them. Um, so, you know, like... Asus is pretty good at doing T-Topology. And it's just, and they're also good at doing Daisy Chain because that's like the default thing you do when you don't want to do T-Topology, uh, you just do a Daisy Chain because that's that's the cheap option. Um, and so Asus is good at doing both layouts and it's really obvious with the Crosshair 7 Hero and the Crosshair 6 Hero where you basically go from a good T-Topology to a good Daisy Chain and it gives you the exact difference you would expect. The Crosshair 7 Hero on 2x8 on a two stick memory setup has a pretty significant memory clock advantage over the Hero because of the the layout change. But that doesn't, that isn't universally true, especially like across different brands. Like you could take a Gigabyte T topology and compare it to an Asus T topology and it's going to give you vastly different results or an MSI Daisy Chain against a, I think ASRock runs Daisy Chains as well. I'm not entirely sure. Um, because a lot of the time you can figure out if a motherboard uses daisy chain or T topology based on if the motherboard has a preferred memory stick, like memory slot. But I have noticed that MSI seems to like MSI seems to pr prefer like the, 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 all of their boards tell you to use this dim and this dim first, even if they're T topology, because I have a, like on X299, they use T topology and they're, they're like, oh yeah, you, you should use this dim and this dim first, which is um, kind of weird. Um, it might be that theirs is not quite as heavily, it's not quite as T topology as say Gigabyte, where it literally doesn't matter where you put your sticks. Um, in fact, it doesn't matter so much on a Gigabyte motherboard that say with the Z370 Gaming 7, um, I was messing around with memory overclocking um, on that board at one point, uh, you know, I, things I do, right? I mess around with motherboards for no other reason than I'm bored. Um, so I was mem messing around with memory overclocking on that board and I was just like, you know what? I've had other Gigabyte motherboards where for no apparent reason, like the memory slots closer to the CPU would work better. And... So I started testing that out, right? Except it's a T topology board. I, at the time, I didn't bother to check the manual to find out if, if there is a bias. But I basically went like, okay, so 
I trained, uh, I trained some set of memory settings on these two memory state. Like I posted and fully initialized memory settings for like these two slots. And then I moved the sticks over and the motherboard didn't even bother to retrain. It just booted the exact same settings. It didn't take any long, like normally when you train in, uh, when you go to some really difficult, relatively difficult memory settings, the motherboard's gonna take some time to figure out how to run them. And that's what we call training. And basically the motherboard, it, like you, you could put any layout, like you could go from this, right? You trained on that, you could move to this and it would still post the exact same settings. It wouldn't adjust anything at all. Um, and then you could even run something like this. And if you wanted to be really weird, you could run this and it wouldn't make a difference. It would still run the exact same settings regardless of how you put your memory sticks in the motherboard because it's a T topology where equal distance means equal freaking distance. The board does not care where the sticks are located um, within a given channel. So that's kind of like the big difference between like a T topology and a daisy chain. If you try to do the same thing on a daisy chain, it's gonna have to retrain every time you chain, like if you go from here to here, it has to, has to retrain for that because the distance for each of those memory slots is different, which is also why when you have four sticks, um, you lose a bunch of frequency because you're basically stuck on the frequency of the, the worst of the two dim slots. So yeah, and uh, ultimately that does kind of mean that like, so. Like MSI, for some reason, with their T topology boards, they they still highlight like these two memory slots. But I think they might do that just because it's a case of well, if we always highlight these two memory slots, right? And we sometimes use Daisy Chain. Well, on Daisy Chain, it's usually these two slots that are better. So if we do a Daisy Chain, we don't have to change the manual. If we don't do a Daisy Chain and use a T topology, we can still run the same manual because on a T topology, it shouldn't make any difference anyway. Um, so that's kind of like a interesting thing about the, the different memory layouts is just like, yeah, <laughs> with the daisy chain versus, uh, well, it does mean that it's kind of hard to figure out who runs what. Um, but as far as I'm aware for Z390 gigabyte is running T topology everywhere. I think Asus is doing the same. Um, MSI I think is entirely all daisy chain for Z390. For X299, I'm not entirely sure. I know that some boards are definitely T topology there. Um, for, uh, who is it? Azrock, I'm not sure. Azrock's manual seems to indicate that they're running Daisy Chain. And, uh, but I'm not, like, without actually testing the boards, I have no idea. So, well, more like without asking Azrock, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's the, that's the different memory trace layouts that you can come across. And apparently my Daisy Chain is not daisied here. Bam, so you, you just run that. Whereas, you know, one dim per channel, you do that. It's nice and simple. Um, actually, does that work out to be a bit? It's a tiny bit longer than this one. Um, so, though you wouldn't necessarily lay it out like that. You could, you could make it more optimal, but eh. Um, yeah, so that, that's the three different memory layout topologies that, that you can come across. And really, you should think of them more as memory layout styles rather than absolute, like, this this layout is good, this layout is bad, because you can make a really good daisy chain and you can make a terrible one, and you can make a terrible T-topology and you can make a great T-topology. And you can also make a terrible one dim per channel, and you can make a really, really great one dim per channel. And some, P uh, some board vendors have better one dim per channel implementations than other board vendors. So... That's one thing to keep in mind is just like, this is useful information, but it's really not the end all be all of the, the motherboard's memory overclocking capabilities. And the other thing is it's not just about the board like trace layout. It's also about the memory, like memory support from the side of the memory uh, of the motherboard's BIOS. And uh, yeah, if the BIOS is terrible, like it doesn't matter if the layout is great, it's gonna suck, right? And uh, and in a lot of cases, that can also be just patched with BIOS updates. I mean, if you look at, like, say, the X299 Dark, um, the first BIOS that motherboard came out with is really not good. <laughs> that first version, like, ver like the, the very first BIOS they made for that motherboard, um, you would, like, your the best settings you could realistically run was, like, 4000 CL14. That was basically the end of what, like, the limit of what the motherboard could do on that BIOS. Um, 
And then once they once you move on to some of the later BIOSes they put out, suddenly the board does 3,800, like does 3,800 CL12, 4,000 CL12. Uh, for me, that's 4,000 CL14. I mean, 13 instead of 14 because, uh, m like, I, I don't quite have memory sticks good enough to do 4,000 CL12 on that motherboard. But you still get the idea, right? Like, the BIOS there made a pretty massive difference. Like, you could drop one whole latency... Um, at the same frequency and in fact it's not even like one whole latency step for me it was like it wasn't 3800 cl12 that started working i could run 3930 right at cl12 so i was 70 megahertz down and two clock cycles uh lower latency on the the cast timing so that like huge differences from the bios right so at the end of the day the mother the the trace layout plays a role and a very big one, but you can screw up on either side, right? You can screw up the software side or you can screw up the hardware side. Now, admittedly, you can't fix a motherboard after it's been released. So, um, you know, you, you kind of run into that issue where it's just like, oh yeah, um, the, the, the board was released with a terrible memory layout and it's just never gonna do certain things regardless of how many BIOS updates it does, uh, how many BIOS updates it gets. But, um, Assuming the layout is good, BIOS updates can really make a, still make a huge difference. So, yeah, that is it. Um, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes in this, because ultimately, uh, memory is a ridiculously deep topic. Like, this is one of those topics where you have, like, big different, like, this is the, right now from motherboards, like, memory overclocking is the place where you see like massive differences between board vendors and like generations and specific motherboard models even um admittedly a lot of motherboards like a lot of motherboards will use like the same layout if they're within like the same close relatively close in terms of price range but still um there are like very large differences between certain motherboards actually not cer like a lot of motherboards but there's also some motherboards that use the same layout, so they behave exactly the same. Um, but yeah, so this is like a really, really complicated topic. So hopefully I didn't make any mistakes, because RAM is really not something... Um, I, like, I'm not a, definitely not a RAM overclocking expert, but RAM is definitely a topic I'm very interested in. Um, and so I figured I'd make this video on the off chance that if I did get something wrong, somebody's going to correct me and I can make a correction video. Um, so yeah, if you do have a correction, I'd love to hear it, but as far as I'm aware, this is all relatively correct. The speeds I've indicated throughout the video are all just, uh, placeholder values. They're not necessarily realistic, right? Two, like, one DIMM per channel motherboards these days can do well over 4,000. T-topology boards can also do over 4,000. I just stopped at 4,000 because it felt like a convenient number. Daisy chain boards can go over 4,200. There's, th those aren't, like, limits that I know from experience. Those are just, like, numbers I picked out of a hat, essentially at random, just so I could give you some, some example. Um, so... And, and the gaps between them are also just like, in general, you might see something like this, okay? You won't necessarily see exactly 200 mega, megahertz difference between every layout, especially considering how, how different any, like, implementation of one layout can be. So, yeah. Um, but that is it for the video. Um, I guess thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. And if you would like to... Uh, Support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking. I have a Patreon and there's t-shirts you can buy. You can find a link to all of that down in the description below. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully you'll find this helpful. So I'm, I'm just going to hit the stop button now because this video is over 30 minutes. So my typical length. Yay. <laughs> Goodbye.